All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is um, Diane Orzian Lopez. Um, I um, use she, her, or she, them pronouns, or she, they. Um, I'm also the scholarly resource librarian at um, the University of Texas at San Antonio um, and a part of the planning committee. Um, I'm going to go ahead and just cover some um, housekeeping stuff first. Um, so Texas Digital Libraries and TCDL planning community are dedicated to providing an experience for everyone that is free from all forms of harassment and inclusive for all people. Um, so we ask today that everyone uh, adheres to the code of contact. I'm going to add that to the chat already. Um, and of course, this session is going to run till 10 till 11, um, but take breaks as you need. Um, of course, I always we always invite everybody to say hello in the chat and let us know where you're from, um, share any resources, uh, make comments throughout today's session. Um, you're also encouraged to post any your questions in the chat or in our community document. So I'm going to go ahead and add that community document to the chat also, so you can post your questions. Um, and then we could share that with our presenter today. Um, and so, yes. So um, I want to go ahead and present, um, introduce our presenter, Emma um, Hittrick. Um, and she will be presenting, but I also want everybody to just give her a round of applause. She just recently graduated. So I think that is something that we should all celebrate um, is her graduating from UTI school um, with her MLIS. So yes, congratulations. All right. Um, and there's the link for the community document. All right, Emma, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Diane, and thank you all for the congratulations. I appreciate it. Um, let me just get my slideshow ready. Um, all right, so hello, everybody. Um, my name is Emma Hetrick, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Uh, so I did just graduate from UT with a master's in English and information studies. And I'm also finishing up a graduate research assistant position at the Harry Ransom Center. Um, firstly, I would just like to thank all of you for attending this event today. Um, I know there's a lot going on right now and a lot that could be taking up your time. Uh, so I really appreciate, especially today, that everybody is here joining us. Um, I was really excited by the prospect of leading a reverse workshop about bias in online digital collection searches, because it's something that's been on my mind a lot lately, particularly with the pivot to online engagement with collections during the COVID-19 pandemic. However, I'm not coming here today with a surefire solution to removing all bias from digital collections. Instead, my goal is to share some of the work I've done analyzing just one institution's collections in the hopes of creating a space for conversation amongst attendees that can lead to action. So let's get started. The HRC is a cultural heritage institution at the University of Texas at Austin with a wide array of collections, programming, and initiatives. It has over 1 million books, 42 million manuscripts, 5 million photographs, and 100,000 pieces of art. I began working at the HRC in September of 2020 in the midst of the COVID-19 global pandemic. As a result of the HRC's closure, for the first year of my position, my access to the center's collections was limited to the items that were digitized in the digital collections. This prompted me to think critically about digital archival engagement and how it's not a replacement for in-person reading room experiences, but rather that it enables an altogether different type of engagement with archival materials. It also encouraged me to investigate how well these online collections represented the center's physical collections and how well these collections represented people from marginalized communities with a focus on gender and race. The HRC's diversity committee has been in place since early 2020. 
Since then, the committee has devised a diversity action plan, viewable on the HRC's website, working with departments across the institution to determine needs. The most recent version of this plan was published in April 2021. Items from the diversity action plan that discuss reviewing web and public facing content to improve accessibility and functionality are of particular re relevance to the present study. The project I'll be discussing with you today analyzes the HRC's digital collections within the context of critical archival studies, critical internet studies, and search engine studies. The aim is to identify how the search function of these collections operates and determine how well it provides relevant results for searches about identity. This research contributes to several of the efforts in the HRC's diversity action plan and provides actionable recommendations to increase the accessibility, inclusivity, and representation of the HRC's collections and the way that they're described online. This project is framed by Michelle Caswell's concept of critical archival studies, where the biases and discrimination in archival and record keeping practices are identified in order to determine goals for changing these practices to be more inclusive and ethical. The HRC offers a selection of digitized content through its online collections. These collections can be accessed from the HRC's main webpage by clicking on the collections tab at the top of the page and then the digital collections section. The descriptive text at the top of the page for the digital collections indicates that the digital collections are not comprehensive with the HRC's holdings. This becomes quite obvious when one compares the 97 collections that comprise the digital collections with the 1,558 collections at this time of writing with finding aids. And even this list is not entirely comprehensive as some collections do not yet have finding aids. The interface itself is Content DM, an online database management system that according to its website allows you to make to easily build and showcase your digital collections on your personalized website, making them more discoverable to people around the world. According to the Ransom Center's 2019 to 2020 annual report, the movie posters digital collection is the most accessed collection on the website, followed by the Gabriel Garcia Marquez collection, the Mike Wallace interview collection, and posters from the World War I collection. A significant number of the digital collections relate to white, English, Irish, or Scottish male writers from the 19th century. Granted, the collections at the HRC, like many traditional humanities centers, are overwhelmingly white and male. But this seems like a missed opportunity, given, for example, the breadth of collection materials related to African American studies, as seen on the research guide that's available online. The case study presented in due course will consider how African Americans are represented or not in the HRC digital collections in greater detail. In the online post digitization, just because you can doesn't mean you should, tech DEI consultant Tara Robertson argues that we need to have an in-depth discussion about the ethics of digitization in libraries. It's unclear why the HRC has digitized certain collections but not others. Furthermore, not all of the physical items for any given collection have been digitized. This lack of information leads to the questions, how does the HRC decide which items to digitize? How representative of the physical collections are the digital collections? And moreover, who is represented in these collections? These questions form the backbone of a project on data visualizations with the HRC's Spanish Theodore Swartz's collection that I completed in late 2020 and presented at last year's conference. Studies of web searches have primarily fallen into three categories. One, those that primary, primarily use transaction log analysis. Two, those that incorporate users in a laboratory survey or other experimental setting. And three, those that examine issues related to or affecting web searching. The present project introduces a fourth category of study, one that incorporates critical archival studies into web search studies in order to understand how searches represent people in their categorical structures and results, and how these representations have real world impacts. The internet is now a ubiquitous source of information. However, many internet users do not have a good sense of how web systems and site content are designed. 
The utopian view of the internet as a space of unfettered access and inclusion has proven to be untrue. As internet studies scholar Sophia Noble has written, gender and race are socially constructed and mutually constituted through science and technology. The very notion that technologies are neutral must be directly challenged as a misnomer. In other words, the internet continues to reinforce biases and resultant oppressions that exist in the real world. Jesse Daniels, also an internet studies scholar, explains that the mechanisms of colorblind racism are interwoven in fantasies of the internet as a raceless utopia that exists alongside the realities of racial inequality in the tech industry. Thus, bringing these two ideas together, noble rights, whenever blatant perspectives mired in racism, sexism, or other, other equally unpalatable ideologies pervade society at large, they are carried into and reproduced within cyberspace. This may not be done intentionally, but as Noble explicates, it does have harmful consequences. With the advent of the internet then, comes the increased use of search engines to navigate the internet's contents. This increase in usage also comes with an increase in power over sharing, shaping people's understandings of topics. Brinka explains that for every given search term, a search engine engages with its automatic algorithm to decide what information to present to the searcher. For this reason, search engines are seen as wielding a great deal of power in what people know about a given topic. As will be seen in this case study, search engines are not always equipped to understand a user's intent in a search engine. Most scholarship about search engines focuses solely on commercial search engines. This project then serves a pressing need for more scholarship about library search tools and the role they play in reinforcing certain identity representations on the web. In a 2012 Pew Research Center survey, the following presenters percentages reveal that users report generally good outcomes and relatively high confidence in the capabilities of search engines. What is most interesting in these facts and figures is the high importance of search results yielding information relevant to the search, the relatively low percentage of people who reported critical information missing in their searches, and the relatively high number of search engine users who believe search engines are fair and unbiased. The following case study will show how important information appears to be missing in certain searches of the HRC's digital collections. It also bears repeating that search engines, including those cre created by major corporations like Google and those created by libraries like the HRC are in no way unbiased. This study of the HRC's Digital Collections is heavily influenced by Sophia Noble's seminal work, Algorithms of Oppression, which pulls together many of the topics discussed so far. Noble's main thesis is about the power of algorithms in the age of neo neoliberalization and the ways those decisional, the digital decisions reinforce oppressive social relationships and enact new modes of racial profiling. More specifically, she referred works to disrupt the ideas that big data or algorithms are neutral and that the internet is truly a public sphere. Her method of analysis is primarily case study. She documents her experience typing certain search terms related to identity into Google, the most commonly used search engine, and relates the results to social and historical understandings of race and gender. There are some limitations to applying this methodology to the HRC's digital collections. The collections are much smaller than the Google corpus and any searches reveal only what has been digitized and added to the database. However, we can still begin to do the critical archival work that has been outlined already. Upon selecting a particular image from the HRC's digital collections, a significant amount of metadata is available to be viewed. This includes but is not limited to the title of the item pictured, its creator, format, and collection information. As will be made clear in the examples below, although there is ample metadata for a majority of the digital collection items, the search algorithm inaccurately pulls from the metadata to produce results that vary in relevancy. Furthermore, the metadata may not accurately represent the subjects pictured. Right, and now I'm actually gonna show 
some searches on the Ransom Center's digital collections. Um, so to avoid you having to see me do typos in real time, I already typed in my search term of black girls um, because this is the first search term that Sophia Noble uses in her work. So I wanted to do it as well. Um, when we type this in, we are getting 28 search results, eight of which are advertisements for the circus. And after looking at these advertisements, only one appears to be fully relevant. Um, and that one is here. Oh, sorry, not this one. Um, bear with me as I try to find it. Um, no, oh, sorry guys. Um, but yes, it was the one I picked first, just needed to scroll down. Okay, thank you. So this is an image of a black mother surrounded by her three daughters. The advertisement hails this circus attraction as a two albino girls. Beyond a transcription of the advertisement, which you can see below here, that accompanies the HRC's metadata, there is no mention that the image depicts a black mother and her children. And then if we go back to the search results, the first image result in a search for black girls is a 1928 graduation photo of women from Our Lady of the Lake University. The photo was presumably included in the search because the metadata description includes the notation that this group of girls, all of whom appear to be white, are wearing both white and black graduation gowns. Content DM then picked up the words black and girls included in this metadata description, even though the words are not close to each other within the sentence. While this linkage between terms may in some cases be useful, in this case, the result is an inaccurate match to the intended search term. These results indicate that the search feature for the HRC online collections is not sufficiently refined to yield results featuring only black girls. In fact, some of the results were only relevant to the word black and others to the word girls. Furthermore, several examples, as well as others in the collections, are not humanizing portraits of black girls. As Noble writes, the misrepresentation searches highlights the power of algorithms in controlling the image concepts and values assigned to people by featuring a detailed look at black girls. Differently, a search for white girls yields images that feature only white girls, although these girls are not described as such in any of the image metadata. The results still include some of the same errors of separating the two terms. All right, and now let's do one more search. The second search term I used was African-American. Um, this yielded 94 results. Many included one or more subject terms, African-American and then X, including actors or choreographers or journalists. Notable historical figures featured included Langston Hughes and Jeffrey Holder. There were also items represented on unidentified black persons. Interestingly, and more to the point disturbingly, many of the results yielded items connected to the term African. There were several posters for old movies, which you can see here, including the Royal African Rifles, which refers to Africa as a raging tide of barbarism and features several black characters in the 1955 film, The African Lion, which has no people on its poster at all. So the results for African-American are mixed at best. A decent number of the items are indeed are relevant. They depict or are about black Americans. However, many of the results also portray racist notions of Africans and of the African continent, not to mention completely alighting the American part of the term. While these images should not necessarily be taken down, they should be contextualized so as to emphasize their racist nature and their metadata should be edited so that they do not appear as results in this search. As the global COVID-19 pandemic keeps the reading rooms of some cultural heritage institutions closed, 
While others operate at reduced hours, it's critical for these institutions to consider the accessibility and inclusivity of their online collections. Libraries and archives should make an effort not only to digitize collection materials from underrepresented creators and about underrepresented subjects, but they should ensure that these materials are accurately and ethically labeled. Now is a pivotal moment in assessing digital collections, but even after case counts go down and reading rooms reopen, digital collections will remain crucial forms of archival engagement for people unable to visit libraries and archives in person. Not only does this virtual engagement with collections allow for greater accessibility, but it also enables new and different forms of research inquiry. Digital collections designed with accurate and ethical metadata and for community contributors and varied interaction take accessibility efforts a step further and contribute to the overall inclusiveness in the archive, both re with regard to who is represented within the archive and who is engaged in archival inquiry. So that concludes the kind of presentation portion of this session. Um, and now I would love for us to kind of go past this presentation and think about searching ourselves and um, hopefully opening it up to discussion. Um, so after, after um, now I'd like us to first construct a list of terms. So I, I'm going to give everybody a few minutes to think of terms that you may want to search in a digital collection. And then we're going to spend some time actually searching what those terms. Um, everybody can do that on whatever device that they have. And then after about five to seven minutes of searching, we're going to come back together as a large group and share our findings. Um, OK, so. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording. OK, thanks, Diane. So our first step here is just going to be to spend three minutes brainstorming what search terms you think would be useful for all of us to search for in the following digital collections, the Ransom Centers, UT 